This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. It is just about 5.07. You're listening to the Evening Edition with Lynn and Sharmila. And uh, okay, so just to get right to it, right? The frankly embattled MACC chief, Tansri Azambaki, has said that he's not going to resign and that the fate of his position is up to the Agong. So we wanted to take the opportunity to explore this relationship between public figures, controversy and resignation. Yes, so if you somehow have missed it. Just a quick primer on what happened. Um, So on the 28th of December, Professor Edmund Terence Gomez resigned from the MACC panel uh, over what he claimed was inaction about allegations against Azambaki and um, supposedly his extensive ownership of corporate stocks. Then on 5th January, Azambaki revealed in a press conference that his brother had used his account to purchase those shares. And on the same day, uh, Tanshri Abu Zaha, chairman of the Anti-Corruption Advisory Board, stated that they found uh, no criminal conduct in this. Uh, on January 6th, the Securities Commission announced that Azambaki will be called in for questioning over alleged violation of stock trading laws. Um, now, that is really the, I suppose, the, the bare bones of all the things that have happened and transpired. But a lot of this comes down to, um, and we've used this phrase before in relation to this, right? Um, who's watching the watchman and so on. And when someone holds a position like this, what does accountability look like? What does transparency look like? Yes. uh, And also, what kinds of reactions do we expect, right? Because just to take you back to the press conferences in which uh, these situations were talked about or announced, they were rather brief, right? Um, You know, I think if you recall, if you heard it or if you watched it, it was quite brief. It was just people saying, look, this is what happened. um, and, And that's more or less it. And even when it comes down to this statement that we're talking about, where it's like, I'm not planning to resign, uh, it comes also with the uh, um, with the helping of, well, uh, someday people will know the whole truth. And when they do, you will see that I will be exonerated, so on and so forth. And that very well may be. But um, I think if we just compare and contrast this to the kinds of reactions that we've seen abroad from uh, public figures or like basically people who are the kinds of, what's the word I'm looking for? Peers, I suppose, mm-hmm. the comparable peers. Um, you know, you it is different depending on which country, sometimes which position you're talking about. And this call for resignation, its I want to make it clear, it's not us. Um, it's actually been coming from a lot of different quarters. Uh, the Islam Defenders Association, Bambala called for this uh, just last week. PKI youth members also gathered at the MACC headquarters on the 10th of January to demand this resignation. Um And yeah, so the reaction so far, we've alluded to it, but I think it's worth quoting. Uh, This is what Tansri Azambaki was quoted as saying. Only one individual who is most qualified and who can terminate my duties is the young Dipatuan Agung. Other than that, I don't want to bother about whatever demands are championed by any quarters. So... Essentially, it comes down to he's not planning to resign, right? Um, and I think that's what um, opens up this conversation. Because again, um, what does it mean when you hold a position like this and uh, so much has come out and people are calling into question your suitability for the role um, in Depending on which country you're from, which culture you operate in, it's almost an expectation that there is a sort of public um, owning up, um, not necessarily of having done that thing, but uh, owning up of this isn't appropriate, I need to take a step back, um, there needs to be some amount of letting go. Um, so I think the fact that here in Malaysia, um, we don't see that happen very often is quite interesting. And and I think I think offers space for us to talk about what we really expect from our leaders and people in these sorts of public-facing, public-serving positions. This is the tricky thing, isn't it? Um, Drawing that distinction between I'm stepping down because I did it versus I'm stepping down because... um, because the manner in which I've been called into question uh, affects the ability that I have to do my job well. For mm. example, which we've heard other people say. I'm thinking here of um, Andrew Cuomo, for example, who resigned um, 
last year amidst public pressure over sexual harassment allegations that he has consistently denied. But when he resigned, what he did say was, I recognize that me staying in office is distracting. Um, you know, it's distracting from the ability of my office to do its work. Therefore, I'm resigning. Um, you, re- you mentioned that this is not something we see in our country, but then there's also lots of examples from abroad. And also when large financial controversies break, for example, I'm thinking of the Panama Papers. Yeah, so in the Panama Papers, several heads of government resigned, right? Like uh, Spanish uh, Spanish Minister Jose Manuel Soria, as well as Iceland PM. I hope I'm saying his name right, Sigmundur David Gunlaugson. Um, but uh, it's that notion of not necessarily um, an admission of guilt, but rather an admission of um job or, or suit or task being compromised and therefore needing to take a step back. And um, I think that um, here we could perhaps do with a little bit more of uh, that kind of thinking. So we want to hear from you. Uh, we are talking today about MACC Chief Tan Sri Azambaki saying he's not going to resign and in fact saying that whatever happens with his position is really up to the young Dipatuan are going to decide, uh, which has led us to wondering when is it appropriate basically, for public figures to resign, especially when they're in the middle of controversy, such as the one that we're talking about. And we'd like to hear from you. Call us, double seven double three two nine hundred. WhatsApp, 018-789-8899. Tweet us at BFM Radio. After this, we'll be speaking with Professor James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania. Keep it here on the Evening Edition, BFM 89.9. Bigotry Free Malaysia, BFM 89.9. It is 5.14. You're listening to the Evening Edition with Lynn and Sharmila. And we are talking today about MACC Chief Tan Sri Azambaki saying he's not going to resign and following that up by saying, well, the fate of my position is up to the Yang Dipatuan Agong. So uh, we're taking the opportunity to look at when it is appropriate for public figures to resign, especially when they're in the midst of controversy. And we are asking you that very question. You can call us, double seven double three two nine hundred. WhatsApp, zero one eight seven eight nine double eight double nine and tweet us at BFM Radio. Now joining us today to talk about this is Professor James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies from the University of Tasmania. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. So um, this statement that came from Tan Sri Azambaki, uh, that the decision to terminate his duties lies with the Yang Dipatuan Agong alone, has I think ruffled some feathers. What did you make of this, especially in terms of making a direct reference to involving the king? Right. So I think uh, a lot of people are running for cover now, given that this controversy is getting bigger and bigger. So obviously, in the case of the commissioner, uh, he's invoking the name of the king. Uh, Although we know that uh, the king actually has nothing to do with this, the king actually appoints the person, like most constitutional office holders, he appoints the person based on the recommendation of the prime minister. So to me, right, it's a bit strange that he's using the name of the king to try to protect himself. It's sort of a way of of telling his critics that, you know, if you are not happy with me, uh, instead of complaining to the politicians, why don't you complain to the king? I think for most of us, uh, people in the uh, middle class or people who knows how the system works, uh, they won't take it very seriously. Uh, My take on the situation is that his position is untenable. Is really a question of when he will go. So the way it works in the Malaysian system is that if there is a big controversy, uh, the government will not step in or do anything. They'll wait for a short time until everything comes down before they ask the person concerned to leave the position. Now, the reason why they won't step in suddenly and ask the person to go immediately is because they are afraid that it will set a precedence. And the next time there's another controversy or another you know, Twitter storm or Facebook storm or whatever, that they'll be forced to step in. So the Malaysian way is that the controversy will build up for a while. Then when it calms down, when everyone is sort of a cool off or move on to the next issue, then that person will be quietly asked to leave. And I expect uh, this to happen in this situation as well. Can you give us an example? When have we seen public figures in Malaysia resign, uh, especially when they're in a controversy? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's exactly my point. The fact that you can't remember, uh, it supports my point that when the controversy dies down, when things are a bit quiet, then that person lives quietly. So it's a way of the political system protecting itself. But I think a far more important question is that why do these things keep happening to Malaysia? And I think for your listeners, maybe I will go through a bit of a, a bit of background. I think it really comes down to the issue of Malaysian political culture. And there's something about Malaysian 
political culture that you know we have a very high tolerance for corruption. So basically, one of the things you you notice that even if you talk to you know the highly educated middle class, right, the the assumption is that you know a, a successful politician is somebody with vast wealth who drives a Mercedes with drivers, bodyguard, and what sort of have you. We never really ask what is the source of the wealth. I mean, one of the most interesting newspaper articles today is about a former politician. In fact, uh, one of our former ambassadors who died in an accident. And now his family is fighting over his fortune of two billion ringgit. Now you really have to ask: How is it possible that a politician can accumulate two billion ringgit? I mean, I could be wrong. He could be a fantastic stockbroker or stock picker, but I'm just saying it as an example of how we tend to associate、uh, wealth with politicians in this country. Now you look at other countries, right?、Uh, countries like Japan. Where they have very、uh, low levels of corruption, or if they get caught, they immediately are forced to resign. And the reason is because in that political culture, they have no tolerance for corruption. Right? A lot of their people actually believe that corruption will affect the progress of the country. You contrast that with Malaysia, right? Everybody knows that you know, you know, we are. In fact, we even invented a term for it. We call it "copy all money." <laughs> we even have a term to describe. You know, it means that we have a very high high tolerance for corruption, and that many of our voters or our party, our political class, believe that you know corruption is part and parcel of the system, and the and the state itself doesn't really enforce anti-corruption measures. I mean, you talk about the MACC, people keep thinking, you know, I mean, I, I keep thinking, why do we put so much faith in MACC when all the other anti-corruption agencies before MACC were asked to do a makeover because there was a huge scandal. I mean, most people remember the National Bureau Investigation (NBI) MACC predecessor, you know. And also, the other thing I always find interesting in Malaysian political culture is that we always think that politician has a sense of entitlement. The moment you get to the top, you have this sense of entitlement that somehow the normal rules don't apply to you anymore. You know, you can have a, a credit card, you can buy jewelry, you can have funny money appearing in your account, you can do whatever you want, you know. You know, this is all a sense of entitlement, and and you know, and the system is such that the system support this very high tolerance of corruption because the people actually sort of accept it as part and parcel of the political system, and yet we know this is not true. For example, in Singapore, next door to us, very similar uh, 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 demography, very similar political culture, but they have a very low level for for corruption. If there's any hint of corruption, that official is expected at the very least to step aside. But in Malaysia, we don't. Every time there's a hint of corruption, the official will fight back. And in this case, the most dangerous thing is not so much accusation of corruption; it's the fact that the person concerned is actually going after the whistleblower. So this is comes back to what I said about high levels of tolerance of corruption, because the whole idea of the whistleblower act is that you know,、uh, you know, you encourage people to come out and report so that there can be some sort of investigation. But in the Malaysian case, right, you come out and report. For lack of a better word, you're gonna hunt them, and even if there's an investigation, the institution itself can't investigate itself, and even the investigation institution itself is mired in corruption, because we know that how should I put the MACC has been involved in the defection of a few political part, few politicians from one side to the other side with threats of persecution of corruption. So you see my point. Unfortunately, there's no good news, and I'm sure you regret inviting me to speak. <laughs> Well, no. That's this is going to be my question, right? Whether there is any hope whatsoever that the way in which we relate to people of power or people in public serving positions has changed or will change, because ultimately, I suppose,、um, if we're talking about this issue of culture and acceptance, that、um, it is also going to have to be on on us in some ways to change the way we think about this. Exactly. So basically, the way I I, I really want Malaysians to think about, and I'm really hoping that with the addition of five million young people. Coming into the political process, I really want Malaysians to understand that politicians are just like you and me. There's nothing special about them. Just because they make it to the very top, a member of the cabinet or whatever it is, you don't have to bend now. You don't have to kiss their hand. Just because they got a Tan Sri title, Dato Sri title, whatever, it doesn't mean that they they are suddenly transformed into something else. They're just exactly like you and me. And this whole notion of politicians being a public service, in other words, they are there to run the country and hold our trust. It's not the other way around. 
and this is something that we really need to 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 get the public to understand. You know, right now the public understanding is that if you're a politician, ooh, you're on your way up, and therefore wealth will come to you. You know, that that sort of that sort of crazy talk. Because I remember many many years ago, uh, it was interesting. I was doing research on the Chinese community. Uh, this was back in the early 80s, and one of the reasons that I was told that uh, one particular opposition party will never be successful was because uh, the key leaders of that political party, uh, most of their, their key leaders were driving ordinary cars. They were not driving Mercedes and what have you, and therefore, by default, uh, they are not successful. So why support them? How can we push for higher uh, for a higher level of accountability and integrity in, in our public servants? Uh, right now, it is not possible to do it. In order to, to enforce this issue of accountability, it really comes back to the political leadership. It's actually quite easy to crack down on, on, on public service misbehavior. Uh, all you have to do is to make sure that your anti-corruption agency is really independent. Uh, the way to do it in the Malaysian case is because the system is so corrupt to the core, you have to bring people from outside the country. So if you remember, right, one of the so-called textbook cases of anti-corruption agencies in Asia is actually the Hong Kong uh, anti-corruption agencies. Uh, most people don't realize that when it was first set up, right, it was mostly staffed by expats. Of course, now it's completely changed. Now, now it's part of the Chinese apparatus. But before that, if you look at the history of that, that organization, right, uh, the initial group of people who went in to set up that organization were mostly staff by expats. But of course, you know, it's controversial. I said these people say, oh, why you why you want to, you know, take down Malaysians? You think Malaysians are not capable of... My answer is that Malaysians are very capable. We've been running a corrupt system for 60 years. So obviously, we're very, very capable. But if you want to clean this up, and you want to clean this up seriously, you have to bring people from the outside, unfortunately. Which I suppose leads us quite neatly to our final question, which is, how could the situation have been handled better? Ah, okay. So the, the reason why this situation could not have been handled better was because the actual structure of the MACC is that you've got two advisory boards. And the problem is that the, word, the key word there is advisory. So everybody who sits on that board is really uh, do not want to want to what do you call it take a very strong stand on anything because at the end of the day they understand that their role is basically to advise. The problem is that if your role is to advise, I mean, if you would appoint me to that board, right? Why should I open my big mouth when I know that my job is basically there to, to advise? Because it says so clearly it's advisory. It is not uh, you know it is not a sort of it's not like a board of directors where I set directions to the commissioner. I'm more of a sounding board, you know, an official sounding board to the commission, uh, to the MACC commission, and especially the commissioner. So everybody understand that uh, if this thing had had uh, worked properly, what should have happened was that the moment the allegations of the MACC commissioner, once it came out, he should have gone immediately to the prime minister and said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, there was a problem. This thing is widely believed. Everybody thinks that I'm up to something. So I will step aside for a week or two weeks and you independent, you know, you get either the advisory committee or you get whoever in to come in and do a proper investigation and issue a open, transparent report. I mean that that would have been a, a, a much better way of handling it. And if you do if you have done it that way, right, then we won't see all this controversy because you will allow a period of calmness before the report comes out and people can sort of read the report and, and, and make a value judgment here. Right now, even if you appoint somebody from the outside to do the investigation, right, the whole thing is so politicized, so tainted. It doesn't matter what the report is now, right? Most people have made up their mind already. So you, you see my point, because uh, in the initial period, it was not handled properly. Now it's really too late. That's, that's the reason why I say his position is untenable. Even if everything is super innocent, came out totally uh, clean, right? Uh, there will always be a group of people in the public who doesn't believe him anymore because of all the controversy. You know, like, like they say, you know, the, the, if, you, if you throw enough mud, right, some of this mud will stick forever. James, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you very much. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. Uh, that was Professor James Chin, Professor of Asian Studies from the University of Tasmania, talking to us today about 
Tansri Azambaki and his refusal to resign. He's just said that he's not going to and that whatever happens to his position is pretty much up to the Yang Di Pertuan Agong. So we've been asking you for your thoughts on this. When is it appropriate for public figures to resign? You can call us double seven double three two nine hundred. WhatsApp zero one eight seven eight nine double eight double nine. Tweet us at BFM Radio. I think we have time for a couple of messages because we're getting a lot of thoughts. Well, let's start with this one from um, an anonymous listener who says, past Japanese prime ministers have apologised to their nation and resigned when they failed to deliver and not even over a violation. All I can say is I admire that kind of marwa. Uh, Japan actually and, and South Korea comes up, Taiwan perhaps comes up very often in these sorts of conversations. And it's what we were alluding to earlier, right? It's not always, I mean, in those instances, it's usually an admission of guilt. It comes with the bowing and, and you know, all that. But um, in other instances, it really is just an admission that at this point in time, because of this controversy, I am not able to do this job. I, I simply cannot perform it to the best of my ability. And you know, I think that acknowledgement is a useful thing. Uh, we also have uh, Zukifli pointing out um, a blast from the past saying, as I can recall, Chua Soi Lik admitted bravely, that was me in the video. I don't think I have any response to that, except he did indeed. He did indeed. And also, this is a name that comes up a lot mm-hmm. in relation to being cool with taking the fall, I think is something that comes up. Anyway, um, we're asking you for your thoughts. When is it appropriate for public figures to resign? Because this is something that we see so incredibly rarely in our country. Uh, let us know your thoughts. You can call us double seven double three two nine hundred. WhatsApp 018-789-8899. Tweet us at BFM Radio. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my, bfm89.9, the business station.